Hi there! Welcome to Palette University. Anyone who has pretty much ever played Pokemon knows that most Pokemon evolve, and hopefully most people know that evolution is something that happens out here in the real world. Being a paleontologist who's also, you know, a big nerd and friends with a lot of other paleontologists who are also big nerds, I've been part of many a conversation about how, you know, evolution in the real world doesn't work like evolution in the Pokemon world. Everyone knows that individuals don't evolve, I've heard people say. And this is absolutely true. You know, the, the vast majority of people studying evolution today would agree that evolution by natural se uh, selection is mostly the way that evolution works in the real world. Each individual has a tiny amount of variations and mutations based on their parents' DNA. Those very slight, or sometimes, you know, quite large, variations and mutations could be advantageous and help you reproduce, you know, more kids or stay alive longer to reproduce uh, more over your entire lifetime, at least compared to those without that same variation. Then that, you know, variation gene is passed on to those more kids that you were able to reproduce because you had this variation. Those kids have that variation and are more, you know, able to produce more children than others without the variation and so on and so forth until that be that variation becomes sort of like the standard in the species or potentially produces an entirely new species by itself. That is very briefly how Darwinian evolution works. But what if I were to tell you that Darwinian evolution was not the only theory of evolution out there? The whole concept of low stakes theories is something that I sort of stole slash borrowed uh, from my pal Eden over at the YouTube channel Eden's Things, uh, back when they made Pokemon content more often. Nowadays, Eden mostly makes content about sort of like pop culture and media type things, uh, but their channel is still super interesting and worth a look, so make sure to head on over there and make sure you, t you tell Eden that Palette University sent you. Anyway, evolution. Like any scientific theory, evolution has had a really long and complicated history. Quick side note, though. So, the word theory means something very different to a scientist than it does to a layperson. To a layperson, the word theory is much more closely, you know, associated or similar to a scientist's concept of a hypothesis, which is basically just an idea or a question with some kind of evidence already sort of behind it to support it, but that you look into further to see if that's correct or not. To a scientist, a theory is a hypothesis that has so much evidence supporting it, so much overwhelming evidence supporting it, that you no longer need to justify using it, that it is basically taken as fact. For example, gravity. Gravity is a theory. It's called the theory of universal gravitation. Evolution has just as much, if not potentially more, evidence supporting it than gravity does, so I don't understand why some people think that evolution is controversial. Anywho, that's my just quick side note. One hypothesis that preceded Darwin's evolution is called Lamarckian evolution. Lamarckian evolution, uh, created by the French biologist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, uh, is sort of pretty often taught as sort of a, you know, concept that's sort of the reverse of Darwin, that's sort of taught opposite of Darwinian evolution. Essentially, Lamarck thought that instead of tiny variations that you pass on to your kids that make them slightly better adapted to their environment that they then pass on to their kids, Lamarck kind of thought that you individually change over your lifetime and that you pass down those changes to your children. One example that is really often used to sort of compare and contrast Darwinian evolution and Lamarckian evolution is about giraffes. According to Darwinian evolution, giraffes who had slightly longer necks would have, you know, were, were more fit for their environment and would be able to get more food and therefore reproduce and have more children, thus passing on that longer neck gene to their kids. While Lamarck claimed that a giraffe stretching its neck to get up to leaves to eat would sort of stretch its neck just a little bit, make its neck just a little bit longer, and then that increase in neck length would be passed on to the kids because the parent had stretched its neck. Another really good example would be like bodybuilders. According to Lamarck, if you had one kid 
And then you, the parent, became really muscular. You worked out a bunch and got really, really swole. Then had another kid. The second kid would be more muscular than the first kid because you had not yet worked out and became that strong when you had the first kid. Today we know that's not really how it works, which there's a major asterisk on that because inheritance and genetics are just way too complicated for anything to just be like, to be that simple, frankly. Uh, there is a, an entire field called epigenetics about changes in your genome that you acquire throughout your life. So it's not just like you getting stronger that gets passed on to your kids. That doesn't happen, but potentially some changes in your genome that you accrue just by like, you know, eating certain things that can legitimately change your genome that could potentially get passed on to your kids. So while Lamarck, his normal views were not correct, uh, sort of an interpretation now that we know about DNA has a bit of truth to it. But what does all of this have to do with Pokemon? Well, the other day on the channel, I was streaming Pokemon Ranger and in the final, one, one of the final parts, uh, the challenge where you capture Salamence, uh, you also capture its pre-evolutions, Bagon and Shellgon along the way. And this reminded me of Bagon's lore. If you're not familiar, it's, it's essentially that Bagon just wanted to fly like really, really badly to the point where it would like jump off cliffs and like flap its little tiny arms to try to fly and then, you know, bash its head into the ground. And eventually, as it evolved, it became able to fly. So this doesn't fit Lamarckian evolution perfectly. If it did, it would be, you know, Bagon's, you know, front, its, its arms would turn into wings instead of Salamence where it's got four legs and then wings on its back. So not quite Lamarckian evolution as someone would traditionally think about it, but it may be some kind of hint toward it. But there is a much more concrete way that Pokemon sort of introduces Lamarckian evolution, probably completely by accident. The entire premise of Lamarckian evolution is that you acquire new traits that you then pass on to your kids. And my first thought was that with stats in Pokemon, but that's not true because you know, when a Pokemon hatches in the games, it has set IVs. Those do not change even when you uh, use like a bottle cap on them to raise them. When you breed them, the bottle cap doesn't affect it and it's still the same IVs that it had originally that get passed down. So those don't change. The only stat modifiers that you change, uh, you know, throughout a Pokemon's life, I guess, are its EVs, but those do not get passed down. So that was my first thought. But that, but that doesn't really work out. But then I realized that there's actually another thing that Pokemon passed down that they were not born with, or potentially were not born with, and that is egg moves. Especially in Sword and Shield, where you can sort of, sort of cross transfer egg moves to you know adult Pokemon. Uh, you know egg, the concept of egg moves is literally textbook Lamarckian evolution. Evolution has had a pretty crazy journey to get to our current understanding of it today, you know, all the way back to, uh, you know, Darwin's time of, during the 1850s and 60s. We by no means understand everything about it today, and I kind of doubt that we ever will. But we sure know a heck of a lot more than, you know, Darwin and Lamarck did. Let me know your thoughts on this whole concept of Pokemon using Lamarckian evolution and maybe some other examples that I didn't think of. Uh, let me know about those down below down in the comments. Make sure while you're down there to leave a thumbs up and turn on notifications if you subscribe. It really does help out the channel a lot. Make sure to follow me on Twitter as well at palette underscore you to keep up on all things Pokemon signs. As well as if you feel like this content is worth supporting financially, we do have a Patreon account. The link to which will be down in the uh, description below as well. A massive, massive, massive thank you to our current patrons, Patty Murphy and Sam Accardi. Your support means the absolute world to me. And uh, I've got a little surprise coming for you, uh, both of you, and any additional patrons that we happen to get uh, coming up. Sort of a vlog type thing, which is not something that I've really ever done before, so keep an eye out for that. And lastly, thank you so much for watching, and as always, there's a time and place for everything.